okay? So let's bow now. I want to pray a prayer for you and bless her also. But Lord, we just thank you for your great love, and I thank you for the children uh, who are here today. I pray your blessing and your favor to be upon them. And I really appreciate them that they'll, they'll send just a word of greeting to, to Sheila. And I know, Lord, uh, every little thing helps and makes a difference, uh, whether it's the things the doctors do for healing or whether it's just a, a kind word someone says to get well or we're praying for you. And prayers more than anything are, are the most important thing. So thank you for the young people helping today, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And Leon, I'm going to put you in charge, okay? So you take this bag, you take it, Miss Mia, she's in the back, and y'all can uh, help work on that. Thank y'all for doing that as well. Amen. Um, we're going to continue in a time of prayer and uh, right now, and also any glory sightings uh, that you might have as well, we'll lift those up. We've had several people, we're, we're kind of getting used to the basket again. Uh, if you were looking for it back over on this side, we've moved it now to the the table that's decorated just as you come in over on my right, and it's on the corner there, and there's several requests that have been made. We'll put these out for Wednesday and let people pray over these on Wednesday. But if there's others that if you didn't have a chance to put this in that we might lift up, or if it's glory sighting or prayer, okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Wow. And was it Sharon? Mar Sharon Martin? So uh, Joanne's cousin, Sharon Martin, who passed away, will lift up her family. Difficult time. Okay. Anyone else you would like to lift up? Okay. Okay, that's your sister-in-law, Loretta, a uh, bad kidney infection, and so we'll pray for her. Pray for Scotty Mead. Dan and Scotty come to second service. They're in the choir, and uh, Scotty went in for a heart cath just to actually to kind of check on some things, some issues she's had. They discovered she had, uh, I think, 100% blockage and maybe a 90 and, and some other blockages. They did one stent yesterday to one of the major arteries, and she's come home, but they're, two weeks from now, they're going to do another stint on another one of the, the ones that has a major blockage. So pr pray for her uh, as well. And, okay, Maggie. Good friend of ours, uh, we had her on the prayer list before cancer. Okay. She went back into the doctors, and they found out that she okay. had something that was not the way they thought they were going to get it. Okay. Tell me her name. Michelle Adams. Michelle Adams with cancer that's come back, so we pray for. Okay, Debbie. Um, okay. Okay. So pray for Debbie's mom, some decisions about Possible treatments and okay. 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 So your father Jim is his name Jim, going for a heart procedure, and also for possibly moving in to Margaret. So we'll pray for that. Katie, you're doing, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and we're praying for you. I know you've already had several tests, so we'll keep praying for you. And Paul, it's so good to see you and Larry back there, and they had a trip. Do you want to say anything about the, the, the trip to Houston, or did you do that last Sunday? I get my Sundays mixed up. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Amen. So it's Paula doing doing well, really. So we're thankful for that. Um, and others, just keep, keep um, Carol Hoig in your prayers. She had a little episode this last couple of days. She's at home recovering, and Donna Newcomb's at home still recovering, but needs our prayers too. So. All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we also remember Ukraine and that area and, and all that's going on there. Heavenly Father, as we uh, wake up this morning, um, we recognize the beauty of this day as a reminder of your grace and the powerful creator God that you are. It reminds us of life itself. But we also wake up this morning and, and realize in some ways, I do in, in more special way this week, the, the fragility of life and how gra- fragile it can be. I want to say, first of all, I'm thankful that Sheila was not hurt any worse uh, in this accident and pray for continued healing for and mending for her bone. But I also want to lift up the others that we have heard called out in prayer and, and some very serious, some facing cancer and treatments and uh, different things that they're going through. We lift them up to you and pray for the medication of your Holy Spirit to be in your healing spirit to be upon them. We, we pray for this one who had a sudden death on a cruise and, and others who have lost loved ones that you will surround these families in your comfort and your care and give them strength and help them in a time, uh, Lord, when uh, to give them a peace that passes understanding because really there's no understanding of situations like this. And so bless them, Lord. Bless them with your Holy Spirit today. We pray for the worldwide uh, situations going on and pray for Ukraine again and their people. And we do pray for the Russian people but we also pray especially for, for the ending of those who are desiring uh, to do evil and do evil to others. We pray, come Holy Spirit, and, and intercede and intervene uh, in those lives, Lord, that there can be peace and restoration. So we pray this from the depths of our hearts today. Lord, we also give you thanks for who you are and, and a call that you have placed on our lives that we can love others and bless others in your name. Uh, Let us be people who have freely received and we can be generous, freely giving to others. And whether that be material blessings or whether it be spiritual blessings that we can share as well, let us be your people who can make a difference in the lives of other people. We pray that you will speak to us again today as we're walking this journey of the season of Lent and listening to you. We pray for the challenges that you will give us as well in this season of Lent. So come Holy Spirit. And now we join together as a family of God praying your prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Please join, stand and join us as we sing. Try 
Follow. 
In this life I lose, I will follow. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. Who you love, I'll love. How you serve, I'll serve. In this life I lose, I will follow you. Uh, as the praise team is kind of settling back in, we're going to do something a little different for this service. Why don't you get up and kind of turn? You feel free to move about and just welcome everybody today. Greet them, bless them this morning in the Lord, and it's great to see all of you out. <laughs> Amen. It's good uh, to see everyone. I also want to. Uh, to thank Tom, uh, due to spring break, Tom was our one-man band, but he had a lot of help singing, so uh, thank you all. Uh, we've got some of our praise team on, on vacation, so, uh, but it's good. We always have great praise music. I really appreciate that. Go, on, go, to, go to other places. I want to tell you, the praise team and the choir both are, are wonderful uh, in sharing praises to God. Now, um, last week during the sermon, I, uh, I had a little question, and I said the first one who gets the right answer, I'd buy them lunch. And if you remember, it was Jesus' question, if, is it lawful or not on the Sabbath uh, to heal? Or is it lawful to heal or not on the Sabbath day? And then I asked the question, what did the Pharisees say as an answer? And it was Jim Thomas, who at least was the first one that said, you remember that, Jim? That, that they said nothing. And you're probably thinking, I wonder if that pastor's good for his word. And I want you to know I am, okay? Were you thinking that? No. So here's a $25 gift card to a few different restaurants. So I want to make sure I'm good to the word. Um, also, uh, Carol, Carol Stallard was the one who got it right in the uh, second service. And so she'll get, she'll get a $25 gift card as well a little bit later. So, uh, and maybe I can take you out to eat sometime too, uh, Jim, uh, as well. So... But a lot of you kind of got it right, and I, I will say there were several who had done some reading that said I knew the answer, but I, you know, I wanted to give someone else a chance so, as well. So that's good. No, they really did. So we're going to see today's uh, message is going to be called The Cost of Discipleship, and it can go a lot of different directions. And this is actually, for the ones who've had the J.D. Walt book, this is actually the reading for today and uh, the uh, passage. If you're reading through the passages, in fact, I talked to someone the other day, said, hey, I appreciate you having those scriptures. I've been reading them every day, and it's helped to bring it all kind of in context. And so it's the rich and the kingdom of God. It says these words, a certain ruler asked him, asking Jesus, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not commit murder. Excuse me, adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I've kept since I was a boy, he said. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing, sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, then come and follow me. And when he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this asked, well, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And Peter said to him, we have left all to follow you. Truly, I tell you, Jesus said, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many things as much in this age and in the age to come, eternal life. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. And Jesus, we thank you for your word. And sometimes the word is, uh, is a joyous thing. 
to our soul. It's an encouraging word. It's a loving word. And sometimes it's a challenging word. And today, again, as we've walked this journey from the Mount of Transfiguration, as we're heading to the cross, we realize it's another challenging word that you have for us. We want to be open to listen. And we want to go beyond listening and allow you, uh, Lord, to shape our lives through your word. So come Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I want to start with a couple questions today. And by the way, there's no gift cards for this, but I do want to ask you some participation things. Um, so if you'll raise your hand, if you would like to say an answer, I'll call on probably three or so on this first question, three or four. I want to ask you this question. Think about it you know, real quickly. What is your favorite passage of Scripture or story from the Bible? Maybe it's a story that comes to your mind. Maybe it's a favorite passage of Scripture. Maybe you quote it a lot. And those, okay, I see Mike up in the booth. So say it real loud, Mike. Okay, Nicodemus and Jesus, yeah. Part of that, for God so loved the world. And that, talking about the Spirit, and Nicodemus couldn't understand all that, right? So Jesus is trying to teach him about the Spirit. Okay, anybody else? That's a good one. Okay, Lauren. What's that now? Oh, be still and know that I'm God. Very important for this season, because y'all know I'm an activist, which means I'm on the go a lot, and so have to be very intentional to be still. We all need to be still. We live in a busy world, don't we? So be still, and that's a great one. Anybody else? Okay, one back here. Before you were born, I set you apart. Great scripture. Talking about uh, God's shaping of our lives even before we were born. And that's something about who God is, the purposes he has for us. So those are great. Well, those are all great. Now I'm going to ask you the next one, and just think about this one. You don't have to raise your hand, uh, but... Uh, let me ask you the second one. What is your least favorite passage of Scripture or story from the Bible? What's your least favorite passage? And while you're thinking about that, I will tell you my favorite. One of my favorite I've, I've got to preach on last week as we set the table in the story of the prodigal son. I, I could preach that on and on and on, and sometimes I do preach that on and on and on. I'll never forget being at a revival and I was preaching the prodigal son, and, and some lady came up to me afterwards and she said, you look like a kid in the candy store preaching that. You look like you loved every bite of that sermon, and I do. I love preaching on that. But when I think about this other question, what is your least favorite passage of Scripture or story from the Bible, oftentimes our least favorite passages are the ones that maybe hit too close to home, or maybe they ask too much of us, and it's a great commitment. At my first appointment, I remember leading a weekly Bible study at a senior living place of five to six widows, and that particular day revolved around a theme. We'd have a little theme, a little short passage, and it was the theme of gossip. And about halfway through the lesson, one of the ladies said, well, preacher, you've gone from preaching to meddling, as we talked about gossip. And some of the passages that we least like might be where the Holy Spirit starts to meddle in our lives. This passage of scripture today is not one of the easy ones, but it's another challenging one. And the main person in it is a ruler. That's all we know about him. It's a generic word. We don't know if he's a political ruler or if he's a religious ruler, but by being a ruler, he would have had a high status in society. He would have had a high position and it would have been a position of authority. Now in Matthew's gospel, you don't see it in Luke, but in Matthew's gospel, it says he was a young man young man. And according to the context and all of the, uh, the synoptic gospels, he is rich and he is wealthy. So I might say it this way. This is the story of the rich, young, and famous. How many remember it? So the rich and famous. Yeah, well, this is the rich, young, and famous. But he approaches Jesus in a similar kind of way that I hope we're approaching Jesus during this time of Lent. He seems to want to listen to him. Now, remember in Lent, we started a Mount of Transfiguration, and we heard from uh, God himself, the Father, said, this is my son whom I'm chosen. What did he say? Listen to him. And so we've been trying to listen to Jesus and what it means to go down to the cross with Jesus Christ. But before we saw those words to listen to Jesus, we heard this challenge from Jesus. We'll come back up. You'll remember this from the very first Sunday. It'll be a scripture that comes up on the screen. And then he said to them all, 
Whoever wants to be my disciple, read it with me, must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And denial is a big thing even in the season of Lent, but for all year long. that We've been called to deny ourselves. And sometimes what we deny might come at a very high cost to us as well. The rich young man comes to Jesus and he addresses him in a very uncommon way, I might say, as he calls him, read it with me, good teacher. That's really uncommon. In the rabbinic writings of that day and time of Jesus and his time, they never called a rabbi good. <laughs> never. They don't call a rabbi good. And the reason they never called a rabbi good teacher, they call him teacher, you know, rabbi and so forth, just not good. The reason why is when you use the word good rabbi, it meant you were sinless and perfect. And it also meant that you were full of goodness. And so when he says good teacher, this is uh, what Jesus says in reply before we get to his question. Jesus said, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. And in that answer to this man who called him good teacher, he's doing two things. First of all, we know that God is good. The Heavenly Father is good. He has no sin. He, he is perfect. And you've called me good. And so in essence, what you've said is, I am God. Jesus is God. Now, you might not know that. I could see Jesus saying to that man, you might not realize that when you call me good master, but that's hopefully what I'm going to lead you to, the fact that I am God, Jesus would say. But Jesus is also saying something else. Jesus said these words, Jesus is establishing a standard of goodness that is infinitely higher than what the ruler thinks goodness is. He is establishing something, let me tell you, you think goodness is this? Well, just keep going, keep going, keep going for me to describe what goodness is. These were some interesting words that come from J.D. Watt, and he says this, Jesus is a good teacher. It's frustrating when the culture at large sees Jesus as only a good teacher and denies his divinity. Remember, he's saying both of these things. But it must frustrate Jesus when we declare his divinity and then act as if he's not a good teacher. We ignore his words and commands as if they are not life-shaping. We may memorize favorite quotes, but we fail to order our lives according to them. We may hold others to account according to his words, but fail to align our daily lives under his lordship. We call him Lord, but we don't necessarily listen to him and do what he says. And how common that is, we're, we're probably all guilty of that to no end. And so what, what are we going to do with this word that challenges us? And that's going to be the question for the rich, young ruler. What will he do with the word that Jesus will challenge him with? And so he asked a question that we think is a really good question. He asked the question, read it with me, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I underline the I do because Jesus is going to get to the essence of why he is asking this question. What he is not asking is what happened in Acts 16. In Acts 16, uh, if you remember, Paul and Silas get arrested basically for standing up for God. And uh, they're thrown into a Philippian jail. Uh, they're locked up. They're chained up and all those kinds of things. But when it's midnight, it doesn't matter. You can chain us up all you want. We're going to sing to God. We're going to praise God. And they're singing and praising to God so much, uh, God sends an earthquake, right? The spirit rumbles and, and the, the doors fling open of the jail and the chains fall off. And, and the, the, the guard that is there fears for his life because when the Doors fling open. He thinks that all the prisoners have probably escaped. And that means he's going to lose his life. He's a man with a death sentence against him in that real quick period of time. Except Paul calls out and says, hey, don't worry. We are here. <laughs> no one has left. And it says in that case that that man came and humbled himself and got on his knees. And his question was this, sirs, what must I do to be saved? <laughs> I really want to be saved. And I need to know from you how to be saved. And they give a very succinct answer. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. 
That's a great question for us to ask. What must I do to be saved? This man was asking something else. And I do, what must I do in the sense, what must I earn? What good work or noble thing must I do to, etern to earn eternal life? That's really what he's asking. What else do I need to do to add on to the accomplishments I've already done to earn my way to eternal life. And why do we say he knows he's saying it that way? Because of Jesus' answer to him. He's wanting to know, has any deed been overlooked in qualifying for eternal life? Have I missed something? And so Jesus said, well, I know you study. You're a ruler. You're Jewish. And you know the commandments. And, and then he tells him five of the commandments. Now, we remember there's ten commandments, and the first four are about loving God, and the last six are about loving neighbor. And Jesus starts going through a list of commandments, but he only touches on five, and all of them come from the second list about loving neighbor. Nothing to do with loving God. And it says, for example, Jesus says, don't commit adultery. And I can see this guy saying, I'm one for one. <laughs> Haven't committed adultery. Don't murder. I'm two for two. I haven't murdered. Don't steal. I'm three for three. Don't give false testimony. I'm four to four. I've never done that in court. Honor your mother and father. I've tried the best I can to do that. He, he was saying, I'm five for five. You know what he thinks? He thinks he's perfect. He thinks he's batting 1,000. If we were a major league baseball player and you batted 1,000 for like a month, just a month, you would probably instantly go to the Hall of Fame, right? I mean, that's an incredible thing to about a thousand. This guy, though, he's keeping five of the, what, ten. So we might say, well, he's batting 500. And I want to tell you this, who's in dart ball here? If you bat 500 in dart ball, you're going to the Hall of Fame. I mean, tomorrow night. That is so hard to do. And he's probably thinking I'm doing pretty good. All the lists Jesus gives me, I'm, I'm honoring that. In fact, I've kept them all since I was a boy. I've been a model citizen in that way. The ruler probably thought that by keeping the commandments to others, that made him look at least righteous on the, eyes, uh, on the outside and to the eyes of other people, was the same way that Paul would say he was perfect. Paul says in Philippians 3, 6, 3, 6 concerning the righteousness which, which is in the law, which is the law, he says, this is what I am. That's what Paul said. This was B.C. days. I'm blameless. For the way we externally keep the law, and when other people watch me, I'm blameless when it comes to that. And this rich young man was simply saying, really, I'm blameless when it comes to that. He had a problem, though. His problem is he didn't keep them in the full perfect sense in which Jesus spoke about them in the Sermon on the Mount. Because Jesus has to get to the depth of the heart. He might have not committed adultery outwardly, but I'm going to pretty much guess he probably lusted and maybe thought about it. He might not have murdered anyone physically, but he might have killed the spirit of someone through his criticism. Or he might have killed a few persons' reputation with his word. And even if he had not lusted in that way, and even if he had not said anything ever to kind of discourage someone or criticize someone, Jesus knows there's one thing that he's not doing very well. <laughs> Jesus has left out one commandment. You remember which one it is? It's the last commandment. Do not covet. I, I wonder if this rich man who has a whole lot, after he heard, don't murder, don't steal, do you think when he got five for five and Jesus didn't say another word, he went, whoo, I'm glad Jesus didn't ask about coveting. But by not asking about it, the Holy Spirit begins to point out what this man's problem is. Now, to covet is to desire something that does not belong to you. It is to want something that is not rightfully yours to own. It didn't mean he was stealing anything. It didn't mean he was unethical. It didn't mean he was doing any kind of bad business. He just didn't know who the rightful owner was of the things. 
The owner of his wealth was God. He just never had acknowledged that. Does it really belong to him, your money? Does it really belong to God? Is he coveting God's possessions and desiring them for his selfish needs? And the bottom line is, what about me? What about you? Do we covet the things that really are the things that belong to God because God owns it all, and he thought he owned it all? He knew that this man wasn't having trouble with murder and stealing, but he knew what he was having a problem with. And he knew where his heart was and his covetousness. Now, I want to read something from Mark's gospel, and this is important. It's not in Luke, but this is in the same story. Read these words with me. At this point in the story, it said, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And here's a man who was struggling with a, a greedy heart, a covetous heart, He's got all of these things. And the reason Jesus is going to say some hard things to him is because he loved him. And he knew that this man will never get to where he needs to be in God, in Christ, if I don't say something hard to him. And the reason I won't say it hard to him is because I love him. And he looked at the man and he said, you still lack one thing. He said to the man who had everything, riches, outward righteous life, respect, prestige, authority, power, he's a ruler, but he said you lack one thing, one thing. Jesus knew this man had been misguided, maybe in his life, but even more so, Jesus knew that this man was empty in the most important place of his life. He didn't have a relationship with God. Jesus never had mentioned anything about loving God. He points out the heart of the man's problem, covetousness. And that heart of your problem has kept you probably from loving God or having any kind of relationship with Him. Someone wrote these words, and I'm sorry I missed who wrote them. I saw them. They wrote these words about the story one might say that this man climbed to the top of the ladder of success only to find his ladder leaned against the wrong building. He'd spent all his life, or a young life, getting to where he was. When we were watching the video by J.D. Walt this past week, he was telling us how he came about the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he was talking about the time it came to him in his life. And he was in law school. He was studying to be a lawyer. He said, man, I was at the height of academia. But, but there was something wrong. In fact, suddenly I got to a point that this all seems meaningless. And I was really struggling with God, he said, and, and questioning life and questioning things about God. But that's when he discovers the Jesus prayer. And he begins to be faithful in praying that prayer each day. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he said, I really begin to connect to my sin. Now, that's J.D.'s story. In fact, J.D. connected so much to it. He was able to open himself not only for Jesus to be Savior of his life, but how does that prayer start? Lord Jesus Christ, that he could be Lord of his life. But this rich man, has a, he's got a problem. His problem is that he's made an idol out of his wealth. And idolatry, to have an idol, a lot of people won't have an idol that's sitting there, a statue or anything like that. We're not talking about that. But to have something that is simply misdirected love and misplaced trust in. In fact, he put his wealth before God, and it had blocked his relationship. And the man hadn't discovered something, and so Jesus is going to try to help him discover that and his problem with wealth. And so he gives him probably one of the greatest challenges in the Bible, and it's these words. Sell everything you have, read this with me, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. This might be one of the hardest sayings of Jesus. Sell it all. Give it all away. Is he talking to me? <laughs> Is he just talking particular because this man, that's his problem? That's his idol? Maybe your idol is something else. 
Maybe my idol is something else. Maybe it's something else I've placed in front of God in my relationship. But we still need to ask and have Jesus tell us those words. But there is one thing. Jim, there's one thing that you need to take care of. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In in saying these words, Jesus was challenging this man to love God more than money. In fact, we can't love both God and money. We know from Jesus and other scriptures. And he was talking about, you've got to begin with the love of God. This is the huge obstacle in your relationship. Jesus was saying, be rich toward God. Be rich toward others. Man, you're going to lay up treasure in heaven. Um, by the way, we're not sure if that's just for this guy, for others. Other people have heard that call. Uh, St. Francis of Assisi heard that call. He gave up everything. Mother Teresa pretty much heard that call, gave up everything. We can talk about the people who've heard that call and literally given up everything to serve Jesus Christ. But maybe for us it's something else that he's calling us to that we need to do as well. There were many rich people in the Bible, okay, that put God first. Don't don't miss this. Many rich people put God first. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, Solomon, Zacchaeus, Joseph of Arimathea, Barnabas. In fact, Barnabas, Barnabas was a wealthy man, but boy, he shared with everybody. He sold stuff, gave property away. He did it for the kingdom of God's sake. The money and the wealth he had was not his idol. It was God's, and he would help to use it. There were ladies, Lydia, the seller of purple. She was a very prosperous businesswoman who set up her home to be the base for Jesus' ministry, or for the apostles' ministry when they were in that area. Many of the women disciples had quite a bit of money, and they followed Jesus and supported his ministry as well. Just having money does it, is not a sin, so understand that as well. But that wasn't their, those people's idols. They knew how to use that money for God's sake as well. But this rich young ruler's idol, it was his problem, was wealth. Might be yours and mine, might be something different. Here's the bottom line. If it's hindering your relationship with God, I hope that God will speak to you today so that we can give up whatever that is that might be hindering. May the Holy Spirit speak. May we listen to Jesus. Now, there's two conclusions to this. Jesus was telling the rich young ruler, First of all, he's telling him one thing. You're far from perfect. <laughs> By the way, you might think you have a nice batting average of righteousness, you know, among the people. You might think you're in the Hall of Fame. You broke the last one, which caused you to break the first one. And if you break one, you've essentially broken them all, right? That's what Jesus is pretty easily saying. And that's not enough to get you eternal life. And he goes on to say, with those words, there's nothing you can do to earn eternal life and I love the model it's do verse done he wanted to know what he could do to earn this we can't but we have to trust in what's been done for us by Jesus we trust in what he's done on the cross for us for eternal life what must I do to be saved the uh, Philippian jailer asked believe in the Lord Jesus Christ you will be saved but it's more than that it's not just the beginning of our experience of coming into relationship, Jesus asked this man for much more. He said, come, what did he say? Follow me. How do I do that? Well, you're going to have to deny yourself daily. You're going to have to take up your cross and follow me. There's a cost to that. (laughs) There's a cost to that. And so this man was worried about the future. Will I get to heaven? And Jesus wanted him to be worried about the present because the kingdom of God is here. And it's not just about getting saved and waiting for heaven. It's about everyday life in the kingdom of God and following Jesus. And that's your decision. And and this was his answer. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Mark's gospel, and read this one with me. Uh, If you read Mark's gospel, it says this. At this point, The man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. He went away sad. And Jesus let him walk away sad. 
That's important for us to know. And, and that's what J.D. really hits on in his devotion. He said, this man went away sad, but we don't know what actually turned out. He might have thought about it in that sad state. He might have gotten convicted by the Spirit of God. He might have turned back and come and realized what the idol was in his life. And he might have repented and confessed Christ. We don't know. I want to read, though, this quote, and it was in our reading today. This is a good question. And it's a long quote, so I didn't put it up here, so just try to listen as we end. This is from J.D. What if we didn't feel like we had to soft-pedal Jesus when he says unreasonable things? What if we just let Jesus be Jesus? What if we just listened to him instead of explaining how he couldn't possibly mean what he said? What if we were willing to let people go away sad when something Jesus says makes them sad? What if we could let them sit in that sadness a bit? Or maybe it's me that needs to sit in that sadness a bit. What if we could sit with them in that sadness a bit? What if that is actually what real discipleship is all about? Feeling the weight of the cross a bit. Counting the costs. Weighing allegiances. Making hard yet life-giving choices. And his thing is about this. Sometimes maybe the best thing for me, is that I do need to go away sad if there's something that's been an idol in my life that I want to give up. Or that we can't force someone to come. But in a sadness, it can become the conviction of the Holy Spirit that one can ruminate on and think about and allow the Spirit to lead them to the point where we could be even like the Philippian jailer who just got on his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. In Jesus' name, we'll stand as we have our closing song. And Oh, oh yes, communion, thank you. I'm so sorry. We don't want to minimize that. Thank you at all. Thank you very much. But if you would, we, will, we are thankful for Jesus who died for us. And if you would take, did everybody get a personal communion? If you didn't, raise your hand and Cheryl's got those back there. So as you prepare that, just lift the, the wafer out. Peel the, kind of slowly peel the cup open. In fact, thank you, Maggie, because we're to remember what Jesus has done for us. We'll remember that he's the one that paid the price, that we can believe in him and we will be saved. And so as you take the elements, remember the night that Jesus was betrayed before his death, he took the bread, and after giving thanks to his heavenly Father, he broke it. You can break yours. And he said, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of redemption and said, take, drink, the blood of the new covenant given to you right now, this day, for the forgiveness of sins, for the start of new life. And we pray, come Holy Spirit, consecrate these elements, that as we partake, we partake of your body, we partake of your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And we'll have Tom now lead us. I think the praise team, as they come forward, the altar is open. You know, more than anything, while there's times that Jesus will let us go away sad so that we might continue to think and allow the Holy Spirit to sift in our hearts. He's really glad when we don't go away, but we come to Him, whether it's for salvation or whether it's for prayer, whether it's to give up something in our life to fully follow Him. And so as we sing, this altar is open, I'll be here. If you'd like me to pray, just come to me, and, but feel free to come for any type of prayer. Let's stand and sing. Give me 
that that rich young ruler came back and said those words, give me Jesus. May it be your prayer as well. Give me Jesus as you go from here and go share that good news with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. That's a beautiful song. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I thought you were shaking. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. 